Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. Those who should have been tending to the needs of the people. You know what they saw? Tax collectors and sinners. They saw the refuse and the rubble of the world, and, and they prided themselves on being so superior not just spiritually, but in every way to those people. They actually lost contact with the fact that they were there to reach and teach those very same people. Only with Jesus. Only with you. Moving into the 10th chapter of Matthew, we begin a new message from Pastor Sam entitled, The Lord of the Harvest. The 12 apostles are now all gathered to Jesus, and he begins their instruction before sending them out into the world. Today, we look at the first 15 verses of chapter 10. Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew 10. We're looking at the first 15 verses, the title of our message, The Lord of the Harvest. Matthew 10, The Lord of the Harvest. The passage we're about to consider together today might be one of the most important we'll ever study together. I got to be honest, I, I usually feel that way about whatever passage we're in. But when I look at what's going on in this particular scene and situation, and I look at our culture and the needs that abound, I see that really nothing has changed since Jesus looked out at that mass of people, saw them as weary and scattered like sheep without a shepherd, and began to move on his disciples' hearts to make provision to reach them. You see, in our society, in our generation, there are so many walking wounded, so many lost, dead in trespasses and sin, or backslidden Christians that are so far from enjoying all God has purposed and planned for them. And how we perceive them and how we feel about them and, and what we think and pray toward them and do, really, in, in response it's going to have a radical, dramatic, and eternal effect. Well, you got to back up with me. I had you turn to chapter 10 because that's where the core of our message is. But we got to back up to, by, oh, let's say verse 36. Because we find, there in chapter 9, by the way, we find when he saw the multitudes, he, Jesus, was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I want you to notice that this lays the foundation for all we'll be considering together in chapter 10. And throughout, the focus is on Jesus. What Jesus saw, what Jesus felt, what Jesus said, what Jesus did. Now it's going to shift over to the apostles, but we're going to see even then, they're just carrying out the mission that Jesus has sent them on. They're trusting in Him for empowerment, for provision, for success. And so really, it's all about our Lord and our Savior. First, we see what he saw. Multitudes, weary, scattered, like sheep without a shepherd. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, those who should have been tending to the needs of the people. You know what they saw? Tax collectors and sinners. They saw the refuse and the rubble of the world. And, and they prided themselves on being so superior not just spiritually, but in every way to those people, that they actually lost contact with the fact that they were there to reach and teach those very same people. So we don't want to see as the Pharisees did. We want to see as our Lord did and does. We want to see the multitudes around us as he sees them, weary, scattered, like sheep without a shepherd. Then what he felt, compassion for them. That word compassion means care and concern that ultimately will lead to some kind of action on their behalf. You see, it's possible to feel sorry for people or bad about their situation and do absolutely nothing to alleviate their suffering or change things. For years and years, 
I would think over a decade, Pam and I supported poor children in uh, third, you know, third world nations through Compassion International. It's a powerful ministry. We, we got connected with little kids and took them all the way up into the high school age and, and like over time, we, we took a lot of that money and moved it over toward uh, Gospel for Asia, where now we support full-time missionaries there in, in India and in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and throughout that whole region. But that Compassion International, what, what they were saying is, if you actually have compassion, you've got to do something. And we see that that's how it worked for our Lord. He didn't just feel bad for the weary and scattered multitudes. No, he showed his care and concern and that it moved him to action. What did he say? We see what he saw. We see what he felt. Now we see what he said. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. A plentiful harvest with few laborers, his solution to the problem, he instructs his disciples to pray. And to pray specifically, strategically, Lord, raise up, send out, train up, and ship out those who can rightly represent you to this generation, to reach that massive harvest field that you say is ripe for the harvesting. Now here's the thing. I don't believe anything has changed in all this time. The needs are just as great today. Multitudes weary and scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And while the religious leaders of Jesus' day and perhaps the self-righteous of our day might see them as chaff, not wheat for the harvest, or those doomed to destruction, not to be delivered, those who were sinners, not not loved by the Savior, but hey, listen, we want to have our Lord's heart toward people. We want to do what He did. We want to walk where He did. We want to function as He would. Well, what He saw was the multitudes. What He felt was compassion. What He said is that, hey, it's time to pray. And then we're going to see something amazing in a moment. And that is, he will take these same people he is instructing to pray, and he'll send them out. In fact, you've got to jump ahead just to, just to verse 5 of chapter 10. Here's why. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them. Now, now here's, here's my point. He's, he's going to sort of take a little bit of a, um, you know, a right turn here and, and introduce those who he separated out from the others, those he would call apostles, those he would send out the first 12 to represent him. But the bottom line is that, that little part of scripture shouldn't change the fact that he's saying, I want you to pray. And then he says to the very same people, now go. And I want you to see that same thing, that we need to pray for the Lord to send out workers into the harvest. Why? He said to. And then we need to ready ourselves for his answer, which very well may be, oh, you, it's time to go. It's time to work. Now, a couple things in regards or in relationship to the mission work that he's called us to. It's not the work of the pastor teacher or, or the Sunday school teacher or the pastoral interns. or It's not our work, at least not our work alone, to proclaim the gospel, to go out and share the message. No, that is the work of every single Christian. Now you might say, well, but he singles 12 out and he starts with them. Yeah, because he wanted a right representation of how to go out, not just what to say, but the manner in which it would be spoken, the motives for which it would be done. And so in all of this, we need to see ourselves and put ourselves in the passage so we realize it's not just a lesson on what they did. It's a lesson on what he wants us to be doing. Now, when it comes to what Jesus did, we see faith works, that compassion moves, that concern acts, that love gives. And it has got to be that way. Well, having called his 12 disciples to him, we read then in verse 1, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease. 
If you read all the gospel accounts, what you find is there were a great many disciples following after Jesus at this point. And so what he does is he separates out 12 of them. He introduces us now to all 12 and he gives them to us in pairs. There has to be something practical in that. It can't be an accident because he'll say Simon and Andrew and then he'll say James and John. But, but he doesn't say Simon and Andrew and... No, there's, he, he leaves it off. So it's Simon and Andrew, his brother. And then James and John, his brother. Then Philip and Nathaniel. And, and that's how it's going to go. Why? Because Jesus was pairing them up, sending them out two by two. And I think I mentioned this last time. If I fail to, hey, there's real wisdom in this. If you'll think back, and I know not all of you were partiers, so if not, I'm not accusing you of that. But those of you who did party a little, be it with alcohol or drugs or whatever, you know that you had a partner. I mean, very few people go out to party alone. I mean, that's just to be, it makes the party so dull. And... uh and so most of us who drank, we had a drinking buddy who got stoned. We had a buddy we got stoned with. It doesn't mean there weren't crowds of people around, but we partnered up naturally. And in this case, we find two pairs of brothers hanging together. That, that's often the case. It should be the case. But if it was true in our old life and in our old ways that we had a partner, how much more necessary now that we have a partner? Somebody who's going the right direction that when we start to maybe sway or vacillate or, or be unsure, they're right there to say, hey, no, we're on this mission and we're on it together. We, we have a call and we're going to fulfill it. You see, we all have to have that. Every husband and wife should partner in ministry together, first to their own children and to one another, but then by opening their home and inviting other couples in, even one at a time. If nothing else, to, to just minister to that couple and model what it means to walk with Christ, to share the Lord. And I believe every guy needs a partner, a guy that's his buddy that he shares with and that they pray together and that they study together and that they go out and minister together. Why? Because if we go out two by two, there's a much greater chance we're actually going to do what we set out to do. Some of you have gone down to the park maybe to share the Lord and, you know, Friday night the concert's going and you walk down there and you think, I'm going to go down and pass out some tracks and you run into somebody and you get in a conversation and you already know them and you know they go to church somewhere and then something else happens. It's easy to get distracted. But when two people are going together, you're going to get the job done. Well, he calls them, first of all, to him, separating them from the others. Then they are empowered by him. And this is so important. If we're going to represent the Lord, if we're going to minister on his behalf, we are going to have to do it in the power he provides. And you can ask anyone who's in full-time ministry, and you know my philosophy of that. We're all called to it, but until we all buy into that and start doing it, Talk to those that you know that are living their life day in and day out for the Lord. You won't find all of them on a pastoral staff at some church. We all know Christians that every day of their life they get up and they have a devotion and they pray and then they go out and wherever they are, at work, at school, at play, they represent the Lord. We know them and we want to become more like them. But here's the deal. Anybody who's doing it will quickly tell you, hey, it's the Lord. It's the Lord's power. The Lord deserves the glory. Why? Because you find out right away that he was telling the truth when he said, he's the vine and we're the branches. And apart from him, we can do what? Most things, something, a little bit. No, he says nothing. How much is nothing, by the way? It's nothing. And so... Called to him, empowered by him, sent out for him. That's what's going on in this passage. They're being sent to represent the Lord and that generation. Now, here's something kind of amazing. 
We know very little about most of these guys. And even those we think we know a lot about, like Simon Peter, because, hey, he's a major player throughout the Gospels. He's mentioned often the epistles. I mean, he wrote a couple himself. He helped Mark with his Gospel. He was the major source for John Mark, who was not an eyewitness to these things. I mean, Peter is going to be mentioned perhaps more than any other disciple. But we really don't know that much about him. And some of these guys, all we have is a name and maybe one thing that the Lord mentions, and that's it. And that, that tells us that some of us are going to be noticed and recognized and, and hey, Others of us, we're just going to do the work and stand before the Lord and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, though we don't know much about them, I, I think there's a reason for that. God was more interested in the work than the workers. I'm not saying he didn't love the workers. He didn't die for them. He didn't choose them or equip them or empower them. No, all that's important. But the focus and the emphasis is never on the minister. It's on the ministry, not on the work but on the work. It's not on the messenger, but on the message. And so it begins with Simon Peter, and, and I believe every list of the apostles, the twelve, begins with the name of Simon Peter. These are the names of the twelve, verse two. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother. Already mentioned it, but take note as you go through. He pairs them up. He first puts... Simon Peter and Andrew together. Now, this is a natural fit. These guys are brothers. They've grown up together. They know each other perfectly. They know each other's weaknesses. They know each other's strengths. Simon means reed. Peter means rock or rocky. And I can't even say that word without hearing dun-dun-dun, dun-dun-dun. It's just how my mind works, you know. The, the tapes just start playing. And so here we have this guy and Jesus looks at him and he, and he sees him for what he is. Just a reed vacillating, blowing in the wind. Oh, he's, he's proud and he's strong and he's got all of these, well, all these sort of natural characteristics. But those aren't going to be much use to the Lord until Simon sees himself the way Jesus sees him. Weak and vacillating in spite of his, well, impulsiveness and his aggressiveness and all of those things that we would see and say, this guy's a born leader. But, but Jesus was going to make him a leader who could represent the Lord, see. And, and there may be many here, in fact, I'm convinced there are, who truly are born leaders, You've all your life just come to the forefront wherever you were. But in order to represent the Lord, you need to become more like the Lord. You need to be submitted to the Lord. You need to be trusting in his power and his provision and, and not looking at, oh, look what I can do and, and look at what I have done. No, it's got to really be about him. So Simon, and he turns him from that reed to the rock he's going to make him into, but not before Simon is broken, not before he fails. And if you know the Gospels, you know that Simon would be the one when Jesus says, hey, you're all going to deny me. I'll never deny you. You're all going to forsake me. I'll never forsake you. Simon was forever telling the Lord, Lord, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you have here. I mean, you just don't know me, Lord. And the Lord would say to those of us who think that way, you just don't know you. But God will reveal what we're really about and, and what we really need to become the people he can use to his glory. Now, Andrew, his brother, is... well. Basically, you don't see a lot of him in the scriptures. But what I love about Andrew is every time you do find him in scripture, you find him bringing someone to Jesus. In fact, it was Andrew who brought Simon Peter to Jesus. Andrew had this knack, whatever the need, when they needed the food, he said, hey, here's a kid over here. He's the one who brought him. When the Gentiles came, Philip brought him to who? To 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 uh, Andrew. And Andrew then with Philip went and took them to Jesus. Andrew was always about bringing people to Jesus. So good role model for each and every one of us. 
The next pair are James and John. These guys are brothers. They're called the sons of thunder. We know thunder was mom. How? Well, because they're also called the sons of Zebedee. So you got Zebedee, that's dad. Then you got thunder, that's mom. But as you read their life story, these guys, well, they, they kind of remind you of like a couple bikers or something. They're just intense and aggressive and outgoing and bold. And now they're absolutely committed to Jesus. They absolutely, I mean, I, I picture Peter, James, and John, and then Simon the Zealot as sort of seeing themselves as Jesus' personal bodyguards. And uh, while the scripture never describes them that way, their character, their nature, the way the scripture does describe them, well, it would be easy to imagine them thinking of themselves that way. We're here to protect you. We're here to watch out for you. So much so that it a mere insult when the Samaritans didn't want Jesus to pass through their territory. Long-standing rift between the Samaritans who were part Jew and part Gentile as a result of a captivity that they endured. Well, the, the more pure-blooded blooded, um excuse me, the more pure-blooded Israelites, they, they don't want anything to do with the Samaritans. And well, the feelings, they were kind of mutual. So at one point, Jesus wants to pass through. They say, no, he's not coming through here. He's not passing through here. James and John are indignant. They come and they say, Lord, just give us the word. And we'll call fire down out of heaven and we'll just destroy him for you, Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think, Lord? And he's like, I, I just know. In fact, if, if, if this was my team, and, and you know, God's more merciful to me than that. I mean, he can handle these guys. I never could have dealt with it. But, but he says, you don't know what spirit you're of. The Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And we've got to know, no matter who it is, our, no matter who appears to be our enemy or who we're angry with or frustrated toward, if it comes to that point of we just as well see them gone, wiped out, fried from, with fire from heaven, that's not the heart of the Lord. How can we be sure about that? Listen, if that's what he wanted to do, he would have already done it. And it's not his heart to destroy. It's not even his heart to judge, but that all would come to repentance, that none would be lost, left dead in trespasses and sin. So James and John, always together, passionate for Jesus, but dangerous for Jesus. Now these first four of them, we find the, the three that were... Closest to, they were in that inner circle of Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And, and no doubt you've heard, not just from me, but others, the, the very high probability that these guys, though they had great potential, weren't kept closest because of their great potential, but because of the great potential for devastation and danger if Jesus let them out of his sight. So when he ascends the mountain and he leaves everyone else, he says, you three stay with me right now, right here. And wherever he goes, I, I know how they felt. I, I was the kid that sat in the back until I had to sit next to the teacher. And I raised a kid or two like that. And there are teachers here that can say amen to that. You know, We taught them. But, but the bottom line is... These guys, as strong as they were, as great a potential as they had, Jesus had to teach and train them. And I want to tell you, only Jesus can teach and train a man or a woman to rightly represent him, a boy or a girl to rightly represent him. I can teach and I can do my best to model, but only Jesus can call you, empower you, ordain you, and send you out with any effectiveness. And that only if you're willing to be transformed and used by him. I love how imperfect the apostles were. I love how flawed Abraham was and how messed up David could be. I love that the Lord gave us the full picture of what these individuals were like so we could be reminded that it is Jesus working through us that makes it so we can even get out of our own way. We don't need to be a hero, a scholar, or a leader to do the Lord's work. 
We just need Jesus and we need to allow him to do what it is that he does. The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico and you can visit our website ccchico.com or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.